we are honored to bring you the 2023 Special Olympics World Games. Hands up, bottom. Mom, throw me a biggest welcome home party. I'm coming back. We are all winners. <laughs> My dream has come true. I'm my Michael Phelps. We should include instead of exclude. And that's what Special Olympics does. Let me win, but if I cannot win, let me brave in the attempt. Now we there to cheer you. I'm getting a hug. God, I'm overwhelmed again for the like hundredth time watching that video. Welcome everyone to this highly, highly anticipated global webinar, at least highly, highly anticipated by me and I know by many others. So excited to be welcoming our team from ESPN, Kate Jackson and Matt Leach and so many other discussions we're going to be able to have about how to make videos and stories like that one. But before we get started, I just have a couple of announcements. I want to welcome everyone uh, to this webinar. I wish we were all together more frequently, but it's wonderful to be together virtually. Uh, in this webinar, as in all of our webinars, interpretation is available in Spanish, French, Chinese, Arabic, and Russian. You click on that little, that little globe at the bottom of your screen, and you'll find uh, ways to to hear this webinar in those languages. Uh, and I hope that makes it easier for everyone. Let me also just say at the outset that that coverage you just saw uh, of the World Games last summer uh, that ESPN and, and all of its uh, extraordinary talent produced has been nominated for an Emmy, uh, a sports Emmy. Wow. Tonight is the award ceremony. So uh, I don't think we can see it on TV. Maybe we can, I'm not sure. but. Uh, there's there's ways to to tune in and keep track of that. Uh, we hope uh, Kate Jackson and the team from ESPN win tonight. But either way, I mean, regardless, uh, as you could see in that video, uh, they have done extraordinary work by any definition, not just with that short uh, highlight reel, but with all the coverage uh, of the Berlin uh, World Games. And so we want to uh, encourage everyone to, uh, there's the live stream, Becca's put in the chat. You're welcome to watch that. I also want to just point out that sometimes we have riches in our movement that we're not even aware of, people in the movement aren't aware of. So we're also going to put in the chat some of the great game changer short videos that were produced around the time of our 50th anniversary celebration. Uh, there are stories in there that are brilliantly told of our athletes from all over the world. Athletes who competed, athletes who left institutions, athletes who are working in uh, creative uh, jobs and, and, and companies, athletes who are refugees, athletes who have done all kinds of extraordinary things around the world. They're all beautifully put together and available for all of us to use when we're talking to our sponsors, talking to families, talking to potential donors, talking to volunteers, talking to athletes uh, and, and coaches. So the link to those uh, is in the chat. Uh, I encourage you, you know, they're, they're all short, five, six, seven minutes. 
Uh, scroll through a few of them. Watch them um, today at lunch or tomorrow when you have a little bit of a break. It's really quite extraordinary. The resources we have that were part of the 50th anniversary that are not unlike the highlight reel you just saw. Um, so I need a drum roll, not having one. I'll do it myself. 2027 World Games in Santiago, Chile. Uh, it's official. The first Special Olympics World Games ever held uh, below in the Southern Hemisphere, ever held in Latin America. We are so grateful to our team in Chile, to Carolina Picasso, to all the leadership in uh, Latin America, uh, to Claudia Echeverri, and all those folks who brought this bid to fruition, working with the Chilean government and all of its partners in sports to make it official. We're on our way. You see pictures of the official announcement that was held at the Organization of American States in Washington, D.C. Uh, we couldn't be more grateful and more excited about this extraordinary new historic move of our uh, of our organization and movement uh, into the Southern Hemisphere. It's the first of many, I hope, uh, world games that will be held in places that we can barely imagine today or could have imagined even a few years ago could host six, 7,000 Special Olympics athletes, 170 or 80 or 90 countries. We're all headed to Santiago and anybody who's not headed physically will be able to join God willing through the miracle of television with our continued partnership with ESPN and other great uh, or, uh, media organizations. Other big drum roll announcement. A new class of Sergeant Tribe or International Global Messengers has been named. You see their pictures here. Uh, this is, uh, it's always bittersweet because we lost an extraordinary class of Global Messengers. We didn't lose them, but they've uh, retired from this function of being the spokespersons for our movement around the world, choosing topics, training themselves in leadership, speaking on the power of inclusion, whether it's inclusion on the playing field or off, whether it's inclusion through inclusive sports in schools, inclusive sports and its power to change healthcare institutions, inclusive leadership and its power to change workplaces. These athletes are on the job, ready to go to share the message around the world. And I want to formally welcome them. Uh, David Duncan, one of the athletes there pictured, was chosen as the new chair of the Global Athlete Leadership Council. He'll partner with all of us in promoting the power of the athlete voice in everything we do. Let's see, one or two more quick announcements. <laughs> Last week we were out in uh, Arizona where it was 100 degrees Fahrenheit. I can't remember exactly what that is, Celsius, but it's hot. Uh, but we were there and it was even hotter uh, in many ways because we were there with Michael Phelps and his extraordinary wife, Nicole. Uh, with a lot of Special Olympics athletes talking about Michael Phelps, the most decorated Olympic athlete in history, why his mission is to promote the power of the Special Olympics athletes making history. We talked sports, we talked training, we talked swimming, and we talked mental health, what it means to be safe in the water and safe in your own body, in your own mind, in your own spirit, in your own competitive energy. Uh, Michael it, and, and Nicole are using the full power of the Michael Phelps Foundation to enhance not just our swimming program around the world, but also the way in which we coach and train and treat each other so that we can all find our mental wealth and be prepared not just to compete on the playing field, but be prepared to be our best selves, our real selves off the playing field as well. It was great. Follow on social. We're going to cut a bunch of clips from this. You can see some of the fun pictures we have there. Um, and uh, uh, it, Michael and, and Nicole and all the athletes who were there were really uh, quite extraordinary and more to come from them. Uh, final quick update, uh, tune in alert. We've got our global virtual youth and educator summit on May 23rd and 24th. But rather than me yapping and yapping about it, let's get to a little quick video where we can let the athletes themselves, our young leaders, invite you. Hello everyone, I'm Abdurrahman Altib. I'm Kiara. I'm Sammy Lara, a member of the Global Youth Leadership Council. I'm excited to invite you to join us for the Global Virtual Youth 
and Educare Summit on May 23rd and 24th. This summit is an amazing opportunity to connect with fellow youth leaders and educators. Share ideas and inspire action towards positive change. There's still time to register, so don't miss out. I can't wait to see you there and work together to make a difference. Let's make this summit unforgettable. Bye. Yeah, well done, Sammy. Fantastic. All of uh, the athlete, young leaders and unified leaders. Um, so write it down, put it on your calendars, whatever you need to do to remember. I, I know I always have a hard time remembering these things, but uh, that's just going to be amazing. Uh, just another example. I mean, think about it. Think just of the announcements we have today, the extraordinary reach of this movement. And what you all are doing, your staff leads, your board members, your uh, communications experts, it's just extraordinary. I mean, I just get overwhelmed sometimes, but this is not about me. It's about storytelling. So let me pivot now uh, to introduce my colleague and friend, Chris Rag. Chris oversees all of our broadcasts and social media for Special Olympics. He's been at ESPN, and now he's come over to uh, the the closest sibling he could find for ESPN, our own Special Olympics family in recent years. Uh, he's the point person for all of our relationship with ESPN. And uh, the partnership, as many of you know, started in 2015 globally. It started about 30 years before that in the state of Connecticut. So, so many people in the ESPN family have contributed to our movement over many, many decades. Chris is now on point and I'll give him the honor of introducing our guests today who are gonna walk us through this extraordinarily important masterclass. To me, it's the one of the most important, if not the central challenge of our future. We have the best stories in the world. We just have to find ways to tell them. Chris, over to you. Thank you, Tim. And thank you, Alex, for using that very recent photo of me. Appreciate it. <laughs> um, so our relationship with ESPN and Walt Disney Company, um, if we go to the next slide, actually spans um, four decades. And it's a true partnership in, in every sense of the word. So since 2015, ESPN has elevated our events by broadcasting, reporting, storytelling on our World Games and USA Games through linear networks, digital platforms, streaming platforms, ESPN.com and the ESPN app. Berlin was a, a landmark broadcast for all of us in many ways, and one that hopefully will be recognized tonight with the Sports Emmy Award. Over 500 hours of coverage from Berlin, and for the first time, much of that was live on ESPN streaming service, ESPN+. Plus. And our event was being shown and discussed on ESPN's flagship shows, such as SportsCenter, and the opening ceremony was shown free to air on ABC Network, and America's number one morning show, GMA, traveled to Berlin. They were on site and broadcast segments live from Brandenburg Gate, featuring Loretta and Tim. So... ESPN has smashed the ball out of the park in North America for us, but they are very US focused and don't help us globally, right? Wrong. ESPN has, and Disney have best in class sports platforms all over the map, actually reaching millions of non US consumers. In fact, ESPN's second biggest brand and footprint, if you can go back outside of the US, is ESPN Deportes, especially in South America. So ESPN staff in those regions are very excited about our World Games heading to South America for the first time in 27. Um, and as well as supporting us on the broadcast side, you might not be aware that they have donated $10 million in grants since becoming our global presenting sponsor of Special Olympics Unified Sports. As you can see from this slide, this support has impacted Special Olympics programs, not just in the US, but all over the world. Big shout out to my colleague, Chris Bentz. Hopefully he's on the call who has worked tirelessly on this aspect of our relationship with ESPN and Disney with some fantastic results. But it's the people that bring partnerships to life. So we're lucky enough to have two of the, the best in the business with us today. Uh, Kate Jackson is Vice President of Production, oversees all of our planning and content for Special Olympics that airs on ABC and ESPN. Um, Kate is busy. She also leads ESPN's coverage of the SBs, Formula One, NCAA, AA events, women's basketball, to name but a few. Kate is also a, a pioneer, advocate, inspiration for women working in the sports media industry. She was the first female producer of the Indy 500 free, free race show. 
She's already an Emmy Award winner. She's a huge supporter of our movement, and importantly, she's awesome to work with. Her colleague, uh, Matt Leach, is somebody I was lucky enough, he was unlucky enough to work closely with me during my time at ESPN. Matt is a seasoned TV professional. Over two decades, he's seen it all. He's worked on Monday Night Football, the NBA Finals, women's NCAA, and multiple soccer events, including Euros and World Cup, which is where our paths cross regularly. In fact, right after um, picking up his newly minted SB tonight in New York, Matt's flying the next day to London to cover the FA Cup final and, crucially, the EFL playoff final featuring my club, Southampton. Matt, I need tickets. So, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Matt and, first of all, his Kate. Hi, everybody. Kate Jackson. So nice to see um, everyone here. That I just feel like I should take Chris Rag with me everywhere. That's like a really great hype speech as an intro. I feel like if I could bring him to the, if Matt and I could shove him in the car and bring him with us to the Emmys, I feel like he'd be good, uh, good juju for us tonight. So um, I just want to say hi and say that I'm, I'm honored to be here. I've been part of the Special Olympics since 2015 when we did the World Games in Los Angeles. Um, I was a part of the 50 Films project that Tim mentioned, and uh, it's the only thing I tell my bosses at ESPN that I'm unwilling to put down until I no longer work at the company. I say, uh, I'll do anything you want at the whole company. You just can't take Special Olympics away. Uh, Matt, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Um, so I have been, uh, as Chris said, at ESPN for 20 years, but while I was not with Kate uh, as part of the 2015 production of the Special Olympics, I, I have been a part of the Special Olympics my whole life. I am the proud brother of a Special Olympics athlete who uh, was part of Special Olympics New Jersey for many years. So the Special Olympics has been a, a big part of my life um, since I was a, a child. So uh, when Kate asked me to be a part of her team on this project, it was the easiest yes in my 20 plus year career. So uh, thrilled to be here with you today and, and thrilled to be partners with Kate on this project. Awesome. Uh, Matt is the best, and I hope I never have to do this project without him. I hope that he and I, for as long as we work at the company, uh, are partners together on the Special Olympics. Uh, we do have just a huge team that works with us. We're just two of the faces of the people who make all the storytelling possible across our games coverage. Um, we felt like today, as we sort of break down storytelling and talk about what makes a good story and what to be on the lookout and what to make sure you're thinking about, when you're pitching or creating a story, we wanted to start with an example, something that we felt really proud of, and then use that as a, as a way to sort of bring back some of the teachings we wanna talk about today. So what we're gonna look at now is a feature from um, 2017, which was the World Games, World Winter Games in Austria. And this is Kenneth Ramirez from Costa Rica. He is a snowshoer from Costa Rica which is the Southern part of our globe. So immediately we were intrigued, a snowshoer from Costa Rica. I'm gonna tease it just like that and I'm gonna let you guys watch and then we'll talk about it. Sí, 
principio en la escuela él llegó a repetir tres años primero porque a él le costaba lo que era la lectura mucho la escritura pero ya después de ahí él se puso muy disciplinado a... entonces la mamá y yo le decíamos no no papito este siga adelante usted va, va a superar en, en, en la escuela hasta la fecha que que la salió muy avante hoy por hoy quinto del colegio Quiero ganar, pero si no puedo ganar, quiero ser valiente en el intento. Mis compañeros son buena nota, tres que son buena nota. Ya los otros son muy vulgares, sí. Bueno, este, sí, casi que no creen en uno. Que me molesten, más los apodos no me gustan. Él llegaba muy triste a la casa. Desde pequeñito él era, era gordillo. Y después, de eh, un pronto a otro, él fue, fue creciendo, creciendo. Y gracias a Dios, vea, ahora me pasó adelante a mí. Como que me entró algo al cuerpo y algo me motivó a mí. que él me decía, mami, voy para Olimpiadas Especiales. Le decía, él cuídese. Él decía, mami, pero es lo que más me apasiona. Quiero ganar, pero si no puedo ganar, quiero ser valiente en el intento. Mucho es el cambio que yo y usted en que él. Él es muy, muy reservado, pero pero el mismo programa Olimpiada Especial, el, todo eso va fortaleciendo al todo ser humano. Me levanto a las 4 y media, salgo a correr, voy para el colegio de 7 a 4 y 25 y hago un plan de entrenamiento. Después que hago los entrenamientos me pongo a trotar. Yo nunca pensé que, que con Olimpiadas Especiales fuera llegar tan largo. Y él muy contento cuando él sabe las medallitas. Se, se me vienen muchos recuerdos. Me acuerdo bien de ese día. Y por un momento, cuando se incendió mi casa, yo dije, no puede ser, mi casa no puede ser. Y cuando yo llegué, no encontré nada en la casa. Solo las, solo las cenizas. Y hubo muy llamas, sabía. Todo lo perdí. Quiero ganar, pero si no puedo ganar, quiero ser valiente en el intento. Somos muy, muy, muy pobres nosotros. Tenía una refrigeradora, ahí está hecho un, un puño. Que todavía ni la ha pagado, todavía. Me voy a recuperar algo. ¿No? Cogí una pala que tenía mi papá. A ver si podía encontrar. La mía ya no las encontré. Después de eso, yo decidí cambiar. Empecé a cambiar y ver qué podía hacer. Siguió adelante, dijo papi, yo tengo que triunfar algún día. Tengo que recuperar las, las medallas. Agradezco mucho a una profesora mía. ¿A usted le gustaría participar en los Juegos Mundiales de Austria? Yo le dije a mi mamá, mami, la profe me apuntó en Juegos Mundiales, pero hay que ver si clasifico. Eso, eso, eso cuesta mucho. Yo le dije a él, papi, apenas nos estamos recuperando. Es un reto que yo le pone a uno, uno no puede echarse para atrás. Luego empezó. Y yo dije, no, aquí tengo que darlo todo. 
Tengo que ganar, tengo que ganar y... Yo decía, mami, voy para Oscar, yo no le creía. Traía la medalla y me dice, mami, tome esta, guárdamela porque es una de las tantas que voy a volver a coleccionar. Pues bueno, una grandeza, un orgullo para nosotros, un orgullo, o sea, de que en el, de él desde pequeñito estaba en el deporte, nunca se esperaba que llegara este momento. A... Nunca me montaba un avión, de la nieve, y todavía no me la puedo imaginar, no me puedo imaginar cómo la va a llegar a sentir. No, no, yo sé que Costa Rica, tanto de aquí de Tucurrique, muy orgullosos de él. Lo que me motiva más que todo es ver que la gente me vea como, o sea, un, un atleta valiente en Costa Rica. Es ver a mi familia felicitándome. Estar en mi familia que esté ahí enfrente y que me estén poniendo a mí la medalla de oro. Quiero ganar, pero si no puedo ganar, quiero ser valiente en el intento. That doesn't make you feel like you can do anything. I don't know what will. Um, yeah, that, that one still makes me breathe deep. I see Tim um, every single time I watch it. And that is um, several years old. Okay, you went on mute. Yep, sorry about that. Uh, technology even though I work at ESPN, not always my friend. Um, we feel really strongly about that, that feature even still today and wanted to use it um, just as the example when we talk about some of the things that we think about and some of the things that we do um, in order to create a good story. Um, Alex, I don't want to push you. Are you in a spot to go back to the PowerPoint? I will stand by while you work your magic. <sighs> Impressive, girl. I would be stumbling through this. Just want to say you're crushing it. Um, so we wanted to talk about effective storytelling, and I know it seems pedestrian, but I think it's just really important to talk about what is a story, right? So it's an account of people, real or imagined, um, and events, and this is really important, and it's told for entertainment. It's important to remember that entertainment is something that creates an emotional reaction in you, something you enjoy, something that is fun, something that moves you, something that makes you laugh or makes you cry. Um, it is also an account of past events in someone's life or the evolution of something. And I think the Kenneth story that we just looked at is a great example of evolution, right? This is an athlete who started um, uh, heavier. He became a Special Olympics athlete. He um, overcame some pretty big things in his life. Um, to make it to the World Games. So we're talking about the evolution of a human or the evolution um, of a series of events or uh, the evolution throughout our story. You can go ahead and change it. So what makes a good story? This is uh, a complicated question that we're going to try to make very, very simple. So the most important thing you want to remember when you're creating a good story or, or making a good story is to create an emotional connection with the viewer. That emotion can be anything. It can make you happy. It can make you sad. It can make you angry. It can motivate you. But the only way a story works is if you can create a connection with the people who are hearing the story. And this is going to sound really pedestrian, but it's super important to remember anytime you're thinking about a story, a story needs to have a beginning, a middle, and the middle is usually something that is involving conflict or a struggle, and an end, which is a resolve or a next step toward resolution. So let's think about Kenneth and the story that we just looked at. The beginning is, here's the story of a person who lives in Costa Rica. He uh, has intellectual disability. He is um, a person who has joined the Special Olympics. This is the beginning. He started as a person who was very heavy. Sports changed his life physically um, and mentally. So when we talk about the middle, something that involved conflict or struggle. So some of the conflict in the story is around bullying, 
is around um, struggling to overcome his different abilities for learning. And then of course the fire that ravaged his home and destroyed all of his medals. And then for us, the end of this particular part of the story or the resolution or the step towards resolution is him making it on the team to go to Austria for the Special Olympics and being committed to training and winning a medal. So that's where our story ends here with regard to the feature. It's important to remember that we then take this feature and put it into our coverage. So this is how we would introduce you to Kenneth so that now you have an emotional connection to him. You genuinely care about what he's gonna do. And so you are more likely to watch the rest of the competition to see how he does. Um, I think I saw, Alex, did I have someone with their hand up for a question? I just wanna, fake news, no? Okay, we'll go with I think we're questions good. for the end. Yep, think questions good. for the end. We have a slide for questions. So don't forget it, write it down. We'll save it for the end. Um, okay, so I'm gonna toss this over to Matt, who's gonna give us a little bit more context using Kenneth as our example um, for effective storytelling. Take it away, Matt. Yeah. I think Kate hit a lot of the, the great highlights there. Um, you know, in this story, clearly Kenneth is the primary character. I think it's what we find, it's very important to have support characters within the story, right? And it's difficult to say that mom and dad are support characters. They're very central figures to Kenneth, but a, a great piece of storytelling involves the perspective of multiple people to allow for a, a more deeper understanding and deeper telling of the story. So in this story, clearly Kenneth is our main character and there's additional support people that are telling his story. We find with a lot of our Special Olympic storytelling pieces, as Kate alluded to, you know, when we do stories across ESPN around Michael Phelps or LeBron James, our viewers already have a natural understanding of this individual's background where in, in our storytelling pieces, that is not what we enter into the to the, the show uh, expecting. So we have to, to take a little bit of an extra step, step for introduction. Um, so if you can find time for that, that's fantastic. Uh, it helps create that emotional attachment. The themes, as Kate alluded to, right? There's, there's a million themes in storytelling, love, redemption, forgiveness, good versus evil. You know, in these... You're talking about, you know, for Kenneth's story, right? There's there's the theme of family. There's the theme of love. There's the theme of uh, determination. Um, so those are, there, there's going to be multiple themes usually within the context of a story, uh, but there's a central theme in here uh, with Kenneth in terms of his determination. The plot is our basic story, right? It's, it's the structure, the moving from point to point, your sequence. Um, and it's important, I think, to note while you were watching that Kenneth piece that there is a, a good amount of range when telling that story. I think when we evaluate pieces that feature producers come to Kate and I with pieces, what we try to go back to them with feedback and say is we don't want the story to be told on a singular line. You want to ride a little bit of a wave of emotion as you work through the plot, right? Kenneth got off. Uh, he was overweight and bullied. He found a bit of an identity competing and becoming an athlete. So you're down. Now you're going up. Now he loses everything in the fire. And now we're on our way back up as he heads to Austria to compete, right? The conflict clearly in this case, um, you know, there was multiple, but the, the signature one in this piece is the fire that he is now looking to, to, to get his medals back from what he lost. And then as Kate alluded to where this piece fits within our storytelling, uh, there was no crowning achievement moment as in he has his medals back because where this fit in our storytelling was we were introducing Kenneth within the body of the competition and he had yet to, to get his moment to, to compete yet. So it was introductory in nature, but he was building towards this great resolution moment. Go ahead, Alex. So that's one, you know, we looked at this. This is clearly in the long form feature category. I think this came in somewhere around eight and a half, nine minutes. Uh, it's 
when you're identifying stories and you have a little bit of background, we at least kind of piece out, all right, this could be somewhere in the three to five minute range. This could be in the seven to nine minute range. This is clearly a very weighty piece and we need 30 minutes. And, and this would be a standalone documentary. Um, and then there's other support pieces. So but it's important to note for us that that is not definitive. There are plenty of times that we have entered into um, the process of producing a piece and it is targeted at three to five minutes. And then as feature producers go out onto the road and do some interviews and gather material and get more background, they call Kate and say, Kate, there's no way we can tell this story in four minutes. We need more time. So if you're in the process of telling the story, that will move um, and be prepared for that. And, and you know, time should be a... Um, a guide, not a rule. I would say, Kate, and <laughs> let the draw, let the story right. really kind of dictate what you're going for in terms of your time. Um, and then the digital, the social media, and the news stories. Those, what we've really now, as we all kind of enter this new age of media, um, there is, if you really want to increase reach and visibility of your story. Uh, and your primary character, you really need to hit the story from multiple angles. There, there really can't be a, we're going to produce this feature and it will air within this show. And then we've done our job. We really try to approach it from a, a, a multifaceted angle of let's get our partners on the digital media side to write a story. Let's get our social media partners to take some components of our story and put it out on our social media channels. And, and then we can usually, let's do a smaller version that could air within other shows that drive to our, our, primary, uh, our primary show, our primary destination. That's really the only way you can increase visibility now is by hitting viewers and consumers where they are. And that is you know, on social media platforms, on written platforms, on our, our networks because there's gonna be multiple ways to tell this story. So you saw the one, uh, the long form feature. And now, uh, Alex, if you wanna to go to the, the first video where the piece had run uh, within the body of our Special Olympics show around Austria, and then we followed up with Kenneth's performance. The stadium this evening can celebrate because they gave it their best they were included just like Costa Rica's Kenneth Manessis Ramirez the 16 year old who lost all of his previous Special Olympics medals in a house fire and it took him a while to adapt from those sandy beaches of Costa Rica where he was training to the snow here in Austria but he became fairly familiar with that course he competed in the 100 meter final on Monday placing fifth overall you know he used that house fire and losing those medals as motivation first experience in snow transitioning from sand to snow the adjustment earlier in the week we saw it and it was taking him some time he took the course again the following day placing fourth in the 200 meter final and as the week progressed he became more comfortable in the environment more comfortable with the climate more comfortable with the surface and on thursday kenneth and his fellow costa ricans how about this they won gold in the four by 100 meter relay finals what a week it's been so that was his competition uh he finally got his gold medal and then kate do you want to take here um, this is actually just an example of uh, how we took the story even further in our digital space with a uh, with a written piece. Um, so here's where we take the story, we tell the story about what's happened, and then, of course, the magic of Special Olympics is endless. And so uh, we had some very smart and incredible partners on the Special Olympics side, and we were able to replace all the medals that were missing Um that Kenneth lost in the house fire and we presented those to him. So that was all part of like the follow-up. Here's his story. Here's what happened in the competition. And then here's what we were able to do once we were on site. It just creates a longer tail for our storytelling. Um, Alex, forgive me for not knowing, do we have the 
video of him get great. So let's play the video of him getting, thank you. Matt's like, yes, stay on format, Kate. Um, yes. So uh, we're going to play the video now where we show you that he gets um, all the medals uh, in the moment that we were able to do that for him. The house fire involving his family and losing basically everything, including his prize medals in competition. The first thing he thought about wasn't the medals, but his two brothers who were in the house at the time. A butcher from his neighborhood rescued his brothers out of the house fire. And until after he knew that his brothers were safe and sound, he went to go get a shovel, came back and try to look for his medals. And then that's when that sort of after the relief of seeing his brothers were safe, then the, the pain of having lost his medals really kicked in. De parte de la familia de Olimpia Especiales y, y de ESPN, te hacemos entrega de, de tus medallas. Perdiste en el incendio, mi hijo. Usted luchaba bastante por esto. Congratulations on behalf of the Special Olympics Committee in Costa Rica. They are presenting him with all of the medals that he lost in the house fire. You don't need to win another medal in your life. From now on, <laughs> you have, you're a champion for Costa Rica and the Special Olympics. <laughs> Yep, the magic is endless on this project and proof that uh, proof that uh, good people coming together can change the world. So uh, I believe that's the end of our presentation, um, if I can remain on format since I don't have it open in front of me. Um, so I think we would love to just say like, we tried to, we're trying to hover here like 30,000 feet. Um, we're happy to be as involved as you want, Matt and I, in the future, we can do a storytelling 201, we can do a storytelling 301. Um, just like when you're in college and you uh, continue to sort of elevate and dig deeper. This was storytelling 101 way up here and we are happy, Tim and Alex, if it's okay to answer some Questions, we're, we're, yeah. happy to, we're happy to do that. Thank you. So um, I think we're all a little bit overwhelmed. The chat is almost overwhelming. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how people find all those emojis, but they're, uh, they're trying to capture uh, an extraordinary amount of emotion, Kate and Matt, and, and gratitude, I would say. Uh, it's good to know. I think just a quick update on Kenneth. He's, he's finished school. Uh, he's wants to get back into sports so he's back in the gym he's running he's training um uh back to our movement in a post-covid post-school post-education world uh so this is a this is one of our champions who's still making special olympics history and will continue to make history in our movement uh, and continue to create in your words kate the magic um so we just wanted to have a quick conversation here we'll try to include some questions from the chat uh but i want to bring in dana schultz dana as I, I, you guys all know is uh not only a special olympics athlete but a espn reporter um she has uh, she's a decorated snowboarder she's a person who i've competed against many times I'm not going to get into the results because that's not appropriate <laughs> right now but uh let's just say that hearing the oath there let me win uh i know dana has said the let me win part many times i'm not sure she goes through the whole oath, but uh, she's been at the X Games in Aspen, been a part of the ESPN family for many years. She's raced with Hannah Teeter, uh, the Olympic champion, uh, and she's been part of ESPN's broadcast team as a host, as an analyst, as a reporter. She's a bowler, athletics com athlete, alpine skiing, cross-country ski skiing, snowshoeing, and of course, snowboarding, uh, and now works in Wisconsin for the Early Autism Project and as a substitute teacher. So Dana, welcome to this short period of time we have to uh, kind of listen more and learn more from all three of you about how to do the work you've we've so brilliantly seen. Can you hear us, Dana? Yes, hi, oh, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. You're very welcome. Um, so I guess the first question I have is maybe even more basic than you know, beginning, middle, and end. It's like, how do you find these stories? We have so many people, and I think our communications team is often saying, get us the stories. And they go, well, everybody's a story, but they don't, we don't, it's hard to find this story. What's the trick 
to finding the additional plot twist, like the fire, like the drama of going back to Austria, all those kinds of things. How do you how do you find these stories? Well, that's the amazing team at ESPN. I just I have an amazing team there, and you just kind of go around and walk around, and oh, there's amazing there, amazing family or amazing uh, team member, and you just walk around and see see what you can find, but. I give all the credit to the amazing team I have with ESPN. I don't know that we can take all the credit. Dana is uh, masterful at making friends wherever she goes. Um, she has a fearless nature in her ability to connect with others. And so what I think is great is um, Dana is very good boots on the ground when we're at an event. And just if we just sort of say like, Dana, take a camera and take a microphone and come back with something, she always does. She always meets someone interesting. She always finds an interesting story to tell. And I think that's just the magic of her spirit um, and her ability to make people feel very safe and at ease and very comfortable. And so she's always out there um, without fail, finding people that we did not know about, connecting with them and getting them to trust her and tell them her story. Matt, any thoughts on, on the finding of great stories, the tracking them down? Is there... They're tricks of the trade that our team can learn. I think the biggest thing that we've encountered is really the partnership and open communication that we find with when working together. And it's, you know, when we were getting ready for Berlin, for example, we worked with, with Sydney, who is a great partner who compiled a, just, I call it a book, right? Like it, it wasn't just a couple of pages. It was a book of information on athletes that we kind of had to cull through um, and I think the the result of what we've seen is really just kind of a, um, to your point, Tim, the fact that there are so many great stories, we just kind of pick. Um, and there, because there's so many out there that end up on the cutting room floor that we just don't get to touch on because the sheer volume of quality stories out there and the opportunity to tell them. Yeah, and if I can just add there, when, when we're picking stories, we're trying to be as, again, we have a finite amount of time on right. television, right? We have a finite amount of space on ESPN or on ESPN Digital or on ABC. And so for us, we're trying to be as diverse in our storytelling as we can. So we don't do seven stories on swimmers, right? Or seven stories on snowboarders. We're trying to get a variety of sports. We're trying to get a variety of genders. We're trying to get a variety of ethnicities from around the world when you're at a global games. And so then you'll find like, oh gosh, we have seven stories that are so good from Costa Rica. This is the one we're going to pick because we don't have anything else for snowshoeing. And then it ends up that you sort of have to leave all the other ones um, behind. So it, it is an embarrassment of riches. If only we had endless money and endless time on television and endless human capital to make this happen, we could tell all of the stories. Do you think, I mean, one of my questions is, you know, what what is the most interesting part of our movement for the general audience viewer? What what do they bring? What, what do we bring them that they don't get elsewhere when they watch the, you know, the NCAAs or they watch the FIFA World Cup or Formula One? They, you, you pointed out earlier, they kind of know what they're going to get. They're going to get an Olympic champion like a Michael Phelps or a Tom Brady, whoever it is in whichever sport it is. Um, what, do, what do you think is the key component of our story that people uh, gravitate to, if I can put it that way. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can start, Matt. And then if you want to jump in, uh, for me, it's authenticity. Mm -hmm. So when I deal with Formula One athletes, I do, I never get an authentic version of a Formula One driver. Never. It is a poised and curated version of themselves, but I have never experienced that in Special Olympics. There is an authenticity and a real and like a realness that exists in the Special Olympics movement and in Special Olympics athletes that I think is something everyone is drawn to because they can see that it's real. Matt, anything yeah. else you want to add? Uh, no, you literally took the exact word out of my mouth. It is This is because Matt and I spend is, so much time together. <laughs> it is 100% real. And it is, um, I think, in a lot of ways, relatable more yes. so than, you know, Michael Phelps' ability in the pool. Everyone has struggles and everyone can relate. 
So I think that just is a, is a natural tie to somebody, especially when they are their authentic self. Dana, were you watching that video? I know you've seen it before probably, uh, but as you're watching it, what, what parts of it resonate the most powerfully with you, for you uh, as a person who's lived some of this story in your own life? Um, what part of the story really pops for you? What, what, what resonates? The part that pops for me is the bullying. I got bullied um, 6th through 12th grade by both my peers and my special education teacher, unfortunately. Um, but also the love for the sport. Um, Kenneth loved his sport and trained every chance he had um, and was so excited when he made it to Austria and so was I. I was ecstatic when I made it to Austria and his family um, was with him and so was mine. So Beautiful. The, this, the, the two points you make there feels like they fit into the, I mean, this is not my strength, but just listening, you know, the bullying is part of the setup here. It's part of the backstory. It's maybe part of the middle, if you will, the conflict, the struggle. And the love of the sport, in a way, is the plot line that's going to, we hope, get to the end with this resolution. And I think our people do try to tell that story. They do look for the people who've had the experiences of adversity, and they hold the authentic kind of version of themselves with this love. So I, I think we're trying to do this more and more uh, and not just tell the story of, oh, Special Olympics is fantastic. You know, sometimes we can get a little bit, you know, lured into our own version of us. Oh, wow, you know, Special Olympics is just great. But we don't tell the hard part. We don't tell the bullying. We don't tell the struggle. We don't tell the difficult part uh, as well. Sometimes, I'm not saying all the time, but uh, what, what are the tips? You know, there's a lot of people, uh, Matt and Kate and Dana on this call who are working. They're working communications professionals from around the world and CEOs and many of our athletes. Uh, it, if we wanted to be always on, I mean, these beautiful productions come for world games, right? But if we wanted to be always on, uh, how can we, with almost no budget in many of these situations, how can we continue to keep these stories coming? What's What's the key in this day and age to getting 30 second or two minute or four minute uh, videos that are maybe, you know, obviously not produced like this one, but still powerful. Any Matt, do you, want to, do you want to take that or do you want me to jump in? Go ahead. Um, so for me, I think the easiest answer is technology. I think it's easier now than ever to capture content on your phone, to edit content on your phone, and to deliver content on your phone. So while we had an entire team of people with several cameras and a drone and all kinds of things that went to Costa Rica, really the only thing you need is something to capture the interview, right? Capture the B-roll, put it all together, send it out on your social media. This is the only thing you need. And almost everybody has one of these. So if you're looking for always on, just know that all the basics of what we did was capture video of the story, capture B-roll to support the story, put it all together in a singular timeline, and then send it out to the universe. So for me, it's like, that's how, that's how you're always on. Social media is the easiest way or a digital platform because it's the most directly connected to your, to the one device that we all have on us all the time. I'm sure, I'm sure within reach of everyone is their cell phone. So I think like that, that is the key to just the easiest way to sharing stories in the, in the broadest space we have. Right. Uh, I did notice the drone shots though. Those were kind of cool. I think we, some, some people have, know how to use these drones, some, but probably people on this call know how to use drones and maybe a create those establishing aerial shots of yeah. like Kenneth running. It was just really magical. And the use of the oath, I just, I mean, there, I have so many questions I could go on and on, but <laughs> listen, I hope uh, Kate and, and Matt both said this at the beginning uh, and I know Dana joins them. I hope this is the first of many conversations about the how-to. How do we get, how do we create within our movement uh, this powerful of, uh, you know, vehicle for telling stories? How do we get optimize the gift we have in our movement which is the gift of our athletes their families their coaches how do we how do we get this always on so 
shout out to Sydney, to Chris, to Alex, to all the folks in the communications team, Zara and all of her team for, you know, getting us to the point where we can have this conversation. But also, I, I feel like we're just getting started. I really do. I feel like we're just scratching the surface of the stories we can tell. And this, I hope, is the beginning of a lot of conversations about how we amp up this capacity in our movement. So huge thanks to, to Matt and Kate and Dana for joining us uh, for this first masterclass. More to come uh, in the future. Uh, we, I can't get enough of it. It's super wildly grateful for uh, Kenneth's story being now part of each of our stories too. Um, so we get now to the very end of our of our time together, but you know our new tradition in Special Olympics, uh, many of you know, is that we get to close with with music, with entertainment, with artistic talent. Um, we think our movement has not just sports talent, but every kind of talent. So I'm happy to be joined today by Franklin Caneleon. Uh, Kenya uh, Padron is his interpreter. There is, uh, is it Kenya? Sorry. Uh, Padron is his interpreter. Uh, uh, Franklin is 17. He's recently been accepted to the university. He wants to study engineering or medicine or law or these kinds of things. Very exciting. He won a bronze in Berlin. He is the unified generation. Uh, like so many of you, I hope on this call, claiming a more inclusive future. Uh, Franklin, we're looking forward to hearing you play, but maybe you could just say in advance, uh, uh, tell us a little bit about you and what you want to study and what it was like to be in Berlin. Franklin, eh, dicen que ya te quieren escuchar, pero que si antes te puedes presentar, contar un poquito de lo que viviste en Berlín y lo que quieres estudiar en la universidad. Ah, claro. Yo pienso estudiar en Ingeniería en Telecomunicaciones en la Universidad de Carabobo. En Berlín, yo me una medalla de tercer lugar en la 100 metros libre y un séptimo lugar en la 100 metros pecho. Y también competimos con el sistema descalificado por un error que cometimos. Pero estamos, estamos trabajando en eso. Okay, he said he's currently attending university studying engineering in communications. In Berlin, he, brought, he won a bronze medal at 200 meters uh, free and then he also competed in the 600 meters um, uh, competition. <laughs> That's long. That's long. Well, I know I ran over with too many questions for our earlier panel, but I want to give the floor, Franklin, to you uh, to perform for us, if you would. We're very excited to you might be very excited. hear your music. Ahora sí, te vamos a escuchar. Chad Franklin, everybody is so grateful, beautifully played, so elegant, so simple. I think she, he can be doing a soundtrack for the next ESPN uh, uh, video. <laughs> we can lay that in and, uh, and, and make the, if it's possible, make those stories even more powerful. Franklin, um, muchísimas gracias. That's all I have in Spanish for you, but muchísimas gracias. Uh, Matt and Kate and Dana, so grateful to the comms team. Thank you again. This has been an extraordinary time together. I wish all of you, the rest of you, a great morning, a great afternoon, a great evening, a great night, wherever you are. And we look forward to continuing these conversations about telling uh, the really the best stories in the world. Thank you all. Thanks, Tim and Kate and Matt. Thanks, Dana.